children to come to Bonnie Springs today. If I may have all the children come up here a little bit, we're going to sit on the floor and have a little children's talk today, okay? All right. So, today we're at church and we're worshiping, right? Right? We're worshiping today at church. Good job, guys. And I wonder, Pastor's going to be preaching about a whole new world here in a little bit, okay? Can you guys think of something where, if I say the phrase a whole new world, can you think of something that comes to your mind? Get on.
presents to us in wars far away. The imagination plays a trick. We see these soldiers in our mind as old and wise. We see them as something like the founding fathers, gray and gray hair. But most of them were boys when they died, and they gave up two lives, the one they were living and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country, for us. We owe the debt we can never repay. All we can do is remember what they did and why they had to be great for us.
free me from my troubles. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people ruin my reputation? How long will you timeless accusations? How long will you continue your lives? You can be sure of this. The Lord set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will answer when I call to him. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. Offer sacrifices in the right spirit and trust the Lord. Many people say, who will show us better times? Let your face smile on us, Lord. You have given me greater joy than those who have abundant harvests of grain and new wine. In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe.
Father, we can come to you this morning with thanksgiving in our hearts for all that you have done for us and the way you have kept us safe this week. And on this special weekend, Memorial Day weekend, we want to take a moment to remember those men and women who with no second thought gave their lives so that we could be free. Willing to serve their country <coughs> so that we could experience freedom. And then too, as, as Christians, we remember Father, that your son was willing to sacrifice as well for freedom for us. <coughs> A freedom that no matter what Satan may hurl our way or what doubts he throws in our minds, we can say, you can have this world, but give me Jesus. We also want to think of the many towns, communities, churches, families that have been affected this past week with tornadoes, floods. We ask, Father, that you would be with them today, wherever they're worshiping or wherever they may be. One gentleman said it the best. My wife, my kids, were all safe and the only room standing was the room we were in. And he said, I have to give God the praise. <coughs> so Father, we, we ask that if for whatever reason we might some days doubt that you're there with us and you're walking with us, I pray that it doesn't take a disaster for us to realize we are not alone. That you will and you do walk with us every day. And I pray that if anyone here today is not sure of their walk with you, I pray today they could leave with that assurance that they are yours. They are a child of God. And in those times, in the busyness of the days, May we never get so busy that we don't take time for you. That we don't take time just to say thank you that you have walked with me this day. And I pray especially, Father, for as we remember Memorial Day, we have two of our own young men that are just starting out their careers in the military. And we are so thankful and so proud of them to be willing to do that. And we just ask, Father, for Mason and Daniel, as they set out on this new journey, would you go before them? Would you continue to go with them and protect them on the field? Protect them even in boot camp. But may they draw closer to you during this time, Father. We're thankful for our young people who are not afraid to take a stand, who are not afraid to sacrifice without a second thought. Thank you, Father, for our young people. are learning 
what it is to put God first. For each of our families, Father, on this weekend, we, re we ask that you would be close to them as many of them have lost loved ones. May they sense anew your presence in their life. May they sense anew that you're right there walking each and every day with them. Be with us, Father, as we continue in this service. Your presence in your spirit has been real, so real this morning. From the moment that we walked in that door. And may we continue, Father, to be in a spirit of surrender this morning. May we continue to hear your voice as we have through the songs. Thank you for our praise team. Thank you for Susie who has stepped up to lead us, Father. And we ask for your blessings upon our worship team. We pray your blessings upon Pastor and anoint him this morning as he brings to us your word. And again, may we put aside everything to hear your voice for just the next few minutes. And for everything, Father, that you so graciously have given to us, for everything that in our lives we do and we say, may it be to bring glory and honor to your name. We praise you and we thank you. In your wonderful name we pray. Beginning their 
military journey and thankful for those so much. So if you have your Bibles with you or whatever you carry your Bible on or in, I don't know if they bring, I know some, uh, somebody was telling me last week they bring their uh, their pad or their Kindle and trying to get, get on in the church's Wi-Fi system with the storms and all and got our router, we have to replace the router somehow. So if you're having trouble getting on, that's the reason why you sometimes you have to keep, keep doing it. But whatever you're carrying your Bible on, or maybe you carry your real Bible with you today, that's all in there. I invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 21, beginning at verse 10. Revelation chapter 21, beginning at verse 10. Read four verses there and then skip down to 22. Read that verse. Would you stand me please and honor God for this morning? Revelation 21, beginning at verse 10. This is John the Revelator, the Apostle John, writing these words. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates and with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Now we go down to verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its Lamb. May God have His blessing in His Word. This is the Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Shall we recite our motto again? Once again, all together. Heavenly Father, I give you permission to speak to me, to speak through me, to do whatever you want with my life. I trust the leadership of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I came across a report the other day about how more and more people are moving from rural areas and subdivisions into urban areas and big cities. People are moving in that direction. And that's kind of surprising to me because there's so many jokes about the drawbacks of living in a big city. Anybody hear those jokes or you, you shared those jokes perhaps? I ran across some. Comedian Anita Weiss says, I moved to New York City for my health. I'm paranoid and it was the only place where my fears were justified. <laughs> Explains that. Doesn't it? And then the stand-up routine about traffic in Boston, Massachusetts, comedian Louis Black said, the last person to get across that town in under three hours were yelling, the British are coming, the British are coming. <laughs> uh, I think a lot of us would agree with comedian Jason Love's opinion of Las Vegas when he said, all the amenities of modern society in a habitat unfit to grow a tomato. <laughs> Las Vegas. Yeah. And my favorite put down about cities is from comedian uh, Richard Jenny. He said, this is how Chicago got started. A bunch of people in New York said, gee, I'm enjoying the crime and the poverty, but it just isn't cold enough. <laughs> so they started Chicago. <laughs> Let me jog your memory a little bit. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the season of night. It was the season of darkness. Well, the opening lines, many of you may recognize the opening lines to Charles Dickens' famous novel, A Tale of Two Cities. And in that novel, if you, how many of you remember reading that book? Or remember, maybe it's been a while, you have to jog your memory. But in, in that 
novel. The two cities that were the focal point of Dickinson's novel were Paris and London during the days of the French Revolution. So he talked about the tale of these two cities. Well, I want to draw a comparison. Because today we're going to center our attention on two other cities. And these two cities are the city of man and the city of God. The city of man and the city of God. Now, the Hebrew Bible re reveals a, a certain prejudice against cities. If, you know, if you've ever noticed, maybe it hasn't struck you that way. But you will remember back in Genesis chapter 4, after he slays his brother Abel, slayed his brother Cain, and Abel's driven from, out of the presence of the Lord, driven from the garden, out of the presence of the Lord. And the first thing that Abel does is to build a city. Or Cain does, is build a city. And in the middle of that city, he builds a great tower, the Tower of Babel. And you remember the result of that. God destroys the tower, scatters the people out of the city to every, every corner of the known world at that time. Got them out of the city. Think about the negative connotations around such Old Testament cities like Sodom and Gomorrah. Cities like Nineveh, Babylon. There, there just seems to be a certain sinfulness, a certain grimness, a detachment from God connected to these cities throughout the Scripture. In fact, hell, wrote, wrote the poet Shelley, hell is a city much like London, a populous and smoky city. So a lot of prejudices against big cities or against the city life. And such prejudice even exists today. There's the story of the old lady, or the old story about the lady in New York City who died willing all of her money to God. She willed all of her money to God. Well, a probate judge <laughs> broke the will with the declaration that after due search, she says, it has been determined that God cannot be located in New York City. <laughs> and you know, people in rural areas have always regarded city slickers with suspicion, right? Yeah, just it's just been that way all the time. Maybe around these parts we could say, you know, Johnson County looks at Wyandotte County with suspicion. And you know, like, oh, oh. Anyway, I don't want to open that can where I guess I already did, but I'm sure. <laughs> In fact, I, I found that it was really interesting that when you realize the word pagan, the word pagan originally meant country folk. Originally, the word pagan meant country folk. So let me, that just suffices for me to tell you this, that no environment, no environment today has a monopoly on problems. No environment has a monopoly on problems. In fact, some of the highest suicide rates, some of the highest divorce rates, highest alcoholism and opioid addiction rates in the United States per capita are found in remote rural areas. What to tell you? You can run, but you can't hide. Yeah. Actually, we, we live... In one big city now, really. No matter how far it is to your neighbor's house. Because television and social media are tremendous cultural homogenizers. The, the secular values formerly associated with, primarily with our great cities, are brought into nearly every home in America every day by way of television, social media, all these, all this thing technology has brought. So, for better or for worse, modern technology has made us one big city, the city of man. For better 
or force, whichever it is, technology, modern technology, has made us one big city, the city of Maine. Now suppose, now that we contrast that city, the city of man, with the city of God. Suppose we contrast it, okay? That's what we're trying to do. We're getting after that here. Because John, in his revelation, describes a city coming down from heaven from God that is altogether glorious. It's an enormous city. 1,500 miles on every side. It has perfect symmetry, and it's large enough for all who would to enter the city. It has a wall 216 feet high all the way around, and 12 gates. The city rests on 12 foundations, and on those 12 foundations are carved the names of the 12 apostles. This city of God is called the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem. And within its walls is the new Israel, as we see here in, this, in our passage today. Its walls are of jasper, and the city itself is pure gold. Its foundations are adorned with every known jewel there is. There's no temple in the center, because God himself and the Lamb are the temple. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God is its light. And the lamp, the lamp is the lamb of God. Wow. Can you imagine? I mean, just it just grabs your it grabs your imagination, doesn't it? Your creativity as John is describing his vision of this wonderful city. The city of God and the city of man. What are the essential differences between those two cities, besides the obvious difference in their physical appearance, which is probably symbolic anyway, but so we'll kind of leave that question on the outskirts. But the main question for us this morning is, how can we make the city of man more like the city of God? How can we, in our, where, how we live today, how can we make the city of man more like the city of God? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. <laughs> but let's take a look at it, shall we? Number one, the first difference is this. The city of man drives people apart. The city of God brings people together. It's an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? <laughs> that the closer we live in physical proximity to each other, the more detached we become social. The closer we are, the closer we live in physical proximity to each other, the more detached we become socially. In fact, consider the ultimate symbol of the city of man, the apartment. Right? The apartment. In fact, the very word says it all, I think, right? Apartment. Apartment. Chances are, we don't know the neighbor on the other side of the wall, much less on the other side of town. Right? Because we want to stick to ourselves, we don't want to bother anybody else, and we don't even know what's going on then, although we're nosy most of the time, and we'll stick our nose out the window or peel back a curtain a little bit just to see what's coming in and going down. I know you don't do that, right? Just me? <laughs> yeah. Like, my neighbor's got a new car. Maybe somebody's going to visit them. Well, what's going on over there? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just got to keep moving. I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> a journalist by the name of Gregory Farr claims that one of the most important but less reported stories of our time concerns our indifference and lack of empathy toward one another. And he quotes Pope Francis. I think I included this in your note. Pope Francis who said, we have fallen into global indifference. We have become used to the suffering of others and it doesn't affect me. It doesn't concern me. It's none of my business. 
And we've all fallen free to that. Right? Global indifference. That's the sickness at the heart of the city of man. Global indifference. How much more appealing is the city of God? As, as the beautiful piece of music, the Holy City, puts it, the words in that song, the doors are open wide and all who would might enter and no one is denied. The city of God. Because in the city of God, there's an unparalleled unity among people, all people. An unparalleled unity in the city of God. There are no racial distinctions. There is no class distinctions. No ethnic distinctions. No economic distinctions. Even no religious distinctions. If you belong to God, you belong to God. Amen. I'm glad I belong to that family. Don't you? <laughs> and you see, it's important to note... That the city of God is called the New Jerusalem and that it houses the New Israel. It's no accident that it has 12 gates. One for each of the tribes of Israel. 12. And so John here in his great vision sees that Christianity is the continuation and the culmination of a work that God began way back with Abraham and, and Moses and David. John sees this as the continuation and culmination of Christianity. Here it is. He sees Christianity as part of that. And so it just, it just drives me crazy. The, the most idiotic evil that has befallen the Christian church has been the prejudice against persons of Jewish faith. We're all one family. The family of God. <laughs> anyway, the city of man drives people apart. The city of God brings people together. And this is because of the second truth. Number two, the city of man is governed by law. The city of God is governed by love. Right? The city of man is governed by law. The city of God is governed by love. By love. We have laws, right? We have laws. Why do we have laws? Well, we have laws to keep a person from taking unfair advantage of his neighbor. That's why we have laws. In fact, maybe you're aware of this. I have been for, for some time. I wasn't really sure exactly what they called it until recently. But the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, used to publish a crime clock, which is a set of statistics on how many serious crimes occurred per second in the United States. And the last crime clock they published in 2016 contained these facts. A violent crime occurred every 25.3 seconds. There was one murder every 30.6 seconds. One robbery every 1.6 seconds. One motor vehicle theft every 41.3 seconds. One aggravated assault every 39.4 seconds. Man. And of course, the most tragic of all, school shootings. Certainly these would have been unthinkable just a generation ago. It's just not a pretty picture, is it? Not really. I feel sort of like Vance Havner, the famous uh, evangelist, uh, Vance Havner. He, he says that he and his wife were, were taking a bus trip through the mountains and the bus broke down right in front of a hillbilly grocery store. And the woman there apparently had never been anywhere else much at all. And Vance Havner says, well, let's not tell her. I wouldn't want the poor soul to know. Let her die in peace. <laughs> I'll tell her what the rest of the world is like. Now, now I, I'm, not, I'm not one of those who believe that our society is disintegrating completely. Because if you're a student of history, then you know that our time is no better or no worse than our Oh, we, 
we talk about it all the time. Oh, it just, it just gets worse. It gets, it's just so bad. It's just, this is the worst it's ever been. But it's because we have short memories. Right? The point is this. Anyone, anyone who expects humanity to save itself is blind to reality. Anyone who expects humanity to save itself, whether it's through technology or education or the social sciences or whatever, whoever thinks society can save itself is blind to reality. We cannot save ourselves. We can't. For if we live by the law of self-preservation and by our nature we will manipulate and take advantage of and abuse one another. That's why we live by law. To restrain the worst that's in us. But the law cannot save us. As the Apostle Paul so eloquently pointed it out. Only one thing can save us. Are you with me? In fact, let me just, for example, do you remember the old story? In fact, they made a movie out of it. The Sorcerer's Apprentice. You remember that, that movie? Or that story? And you remember the boy in there who hired himself out to a sorcerer to be his servant and to carry his water for him. Well, like all boys, he got tired of the work and he looked around to find some easier way of getting the job done. For a smart boy, I mean, one day... When the master was away, he prowled around among the sorcerer's magical paraphernalia and he found some certain books with magic incantations in them and he learned a few of these things and he, he tried them out on the broom. Do you remember that in the, in the story? He tried them out on the broom and to his amazement, he found that he could command the broom to carry buckets of water for him. It worked. But after a bit, he detected a little moisture on the floor. And then to his consternation, he realized that the tubs and basins were all full and the broom was still carrying in the water. So he decided he better do something about it. So he got up and he uttered the magic incantation, but the broom just kept on bringing the water. <laughs> As it began to rise around his ankles, he started to panic. He didn't know what he was going to do. He cried out every magic word he knew. And just kept dumping on the floor. Soon the water rose to close to his neck, his chest and neck area. And he began to cry out in, in, in despair and anguish. He cried out. Realizing that he hadn't, he hadn't learned enough. And he was saved at just the last moment by the, by the return of the master. Who in just a few words... Cleaned up the whole situation. Like the sorcerer's apprentice, our only hope, my friends, is in the return of the Master into our hearts and into our lives. That's our only hope. And as we realize the presence and the power of the kingdom of God, the city of God, as we experience and share with one another His love, that is our only hope, my friends. <laughs> that brings me to the final thing to be said. The, the city of man drives people apart. The city of God draws people together. The city of man is based on law. The city of God is a kingdom of love. But here's the conclusion of the matter, number three. The city of man is based on personal striving. The city of God is a gift from above. City of man is based on personal striving. The city of God is a gift from on high. As we've said many times before here, there beats within the heart of every man and woman, boy, or beats in the heart of every person the desire for recognition and appreciation. We all, we all want that. For power and position, for material wealth and worldly acclaim. We want people to like us. We want people to accept us. 
Years ago, Wallace Hamilton called it the drum major instinct. <laughs> uh, it's an interesting way to put it, isn't it? The drum major instinct that all of us long to march out in front of the parade. We strive for success. We build up our businesses. We, we work our way through the ranks. We plan and we project. Some of us dream and scheme. We build monuments to ourselves. In fact, that's often why there are tall skyscrapers lying in city streets. Someone has termed it the edifice complex. I can build a higher building than you. My, my skyscraper can be taller than yours. And each city is trying to get the tallest building, the highest point. You know? The edifice complex. And sometimes even the most conscientious of us may step on someone else in order to climb higher on the totem pole of personal achievement. We might neglect our children, lay aside a, a devoted husband or wife, ignore the needs of a neighbor, not because we're bad people, but because we, orient, we are oriented to our own success. That's how the city of man is built. That's what drives the city of man. But finally we discover when, that when we reach whatever it is that we're striving for, and when we do, we find that it does not satisfy. It does not satisfy. There's only one thing that permanently satisfies, and it comes only as a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You, can't, you don't even deserve it. You can only accept it as a free and generous gift of a loving and benevolent God. That's it. And so here, here is John the Revelator. He saw the holy city coming down from heaven from God. It, it didn't rise from the earth because the kingdom of God never will come from our striving upward. It comes downward as a free gift from God. And I think that's symbolic that John points out for us that we, we recognize that, that fact. That the kingdom of God will never come down from our striving upward. It comes downward from God as a free gift. But when we recognize, when we recognize that it is a free gift, when we realize that we no longer have to strive to prove our own self-worth, when we're able to just relax and receive the love that God has poured out in Jesus Christ, then we will be able to accept and love other people as neighbors, as friends, as brothers and sisters in Christ. Knowing that our self-worth is wrapped up in Him and the way He sees us and what He does for us. That He's given His all. He's given His whole life, His only begotten Son for you. That's how much you mean to Him. And when we really grasp that, then it doesn't matter what other people think about us. And that's why we can treat other people lovingly and courteously and politely because they're our brothers and sisters. So what? They may not think like us. They may not vote like us. That's a big thing you did, right? They may not drive like we drive. <laughs> Yeah, thank goodness. You're right. My, my wife closes her eyes when we're driving and plays you like a ball. Thank goodness. <laughs> we, get, we get so hung up on those kind of things, don't we? We get hung up and they really bother us. They disturb our life. I, I just hope one day I can drive like 10 and pop go really. It'll be really nice. <laughs> Uh, when we realize we don't have to strive to prove ourselves to God, He loves us just the way you are. He loves you enough not to leave you the way you are, but to change you from the inside out and use your unique personality for wonderful things. I don't know if the name Virginia Cronin means anything to you. 
But Virginia Prodan grew up under the communist government in Romania. And under, under the communist government and the president of the country at that time, citizens were encouraged to spy on one another and report any anti-government activity they witnessed. And anyone arrested for anti-government behavior would be imprisoned or tortured or even killed. All around her, Virginia Broden witnessed isolation, sadness, confusion, lack of hope. All around her. She hungered for truth and for freedom from her oppressive society. Virginia Broden earned her law degree and went to work for a government agency. And through a Christian client, she became a Christian and discovered the peace and the joy and, and truth and freedom she'd been searching for her entire life. But she immediately faced opposition from others. Her tires were slashed. Her life was threatened. She was, she was beaten by the secret police. Christians in Romania were often arrested, beaten, and imprisoned. And one day, she tells about this in, in her book, she showed up at her law offices and requested a meeting. Or she was requesting a meeting. A man showed up at her, at her office and requested a meeting with her. It was a trap. She wasn't aware of it. But as soon as she shut the office door, the man pulled out a gun. He had been sent to kill her. And in spite of her fear, Virginia Proton decided to share her faith with this man who was sent to kill her. And she said to him, Have you ever asked yourself, Why do I exist? Or why am I here? Or what is the meaning of life? Can you imagine somebody there to kill you, assassinate you, and get confronted with questions like that? She went on to tell him, I want to ask myself those questions. And let me tell you, you are here because God put you here. And He has put you to a test. She says, will you abide in God or in the will of man? Your boss, the president. I can't even say his name. He requires you to worship him. God has given you free will to choose who you live for. <laughs> it's a powerful message. Virginia shared the message of Jesus with this man, and he put away his gun and agreed to attend church with her. Get in. And today. Virginia Proton's would-be assassin is a Christian. And in fact, he has enrolled in seminary to study the gospel. <laughs> Quite a story. You see, wonderful, marvelous things can happen in the city of man where there are people who are also hold a dual citizenship in the city of God. That's how we change the city of man, to become more like the city of God. One person at a time, doing what you know to do, what God puts on your heart, what He leads you to do. That we don't shrink back, but we do anyway. Do you have dual citizenship this morning? I pray. Let me go back to that book, the novel. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. A Tale of Two Cities. And my question this morning is, in which of those cities do you live? Which city claims your primary allegiance? That's the question. In which city do you live and which city gets your primary allegiance? And where are you, this is my ending question, where are you investing your time and your talent and your treasure? The city of man or the city of God? See, it just takes ordinary people like me, like you, ordinary, just ordinary people, nothing special about it, right? But just ordinary people seeking earnestly, wholeheartedly to please God in every area of our life. That's all it takes to change the city of man to be more like the city of God.
Which city are you claiming this morning? Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you for how it speaks to us. Right where we are, right where we live. <coughs> causes us to, to think about what, you, what it is we need to think about. So this morning, Lord, we rejoice that in your word preached and in your word made incarnate and your word made holy scripture, we are always that we always encounter the utterance of you, the living God. So I pray for us that you would attune us to this word, we ask. And like the psalmist of old, let, it, let us hide it in our hearts, for, for there it will both take root and bear fruit. And ultimately rebound to the praise of your glory and honor. We, we do praise you this morning for your faithfulness to us in the midst of our betrayals. And your goodness to us when we are assaulted by evil. Your wisdom for us when we were almost seduced by the less than wise. You're, you're patient with us when we were about to give up on ourselves. Let us find in you. I pray all that we need and all that we hope for. For God, by whose word the universe has been created, by whose brooding presence mankind comes to populate the earth, and by whose tender compassion all peoples are called, called and recalled through your word to relationship with you in, a, in an effort to change the city of man to become more like the city of God. I thank you for all those who before us have lived in the faith and now triumphant live with you. And they are part of the cloud of witnesses around us, cheering us on and letting us know that we can do it. We can make it to keep steady, holding fast. Only faith can guarantee the blessing that we hope for or, or prove the existence of realities that, that at the present remain unseen. It was for faith that our ancestors were commended. Thank you for the faith of the founders of, of this very congregation. With so many witnesses in a, in a great cloud on every side of us, we call on your abiding attention and love and guidance that we might be your faithful people through another day. Through another week. Lord, I pray. So now, Holy Spirit of God, pour upon us your gift of guidance. We live in this day which specializes in confusion. We live in this time where your spirit sounds suspect to rational minds. Confirm in us your courage for faith in this suspicious age. For Lord, we are your church. We, we, we've gathered here together, committed. We've made a commitment to be a part of the city of God, to change the city of man, to become more like the city of God. So guide us with your renewing spirit. Give us the heart to awaken to your wonders and the faith to welcome your signs of hope all around us. And even this week, let it be so. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Would you stand please with me and receive the benediction this morning? <laughs> Brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> empowered by God's Spirit and made bold as the church of Jesus Christ. We move from this sanctuary into the larger world to begin work <coughs> at helping the city of man become more like the city of God. Here we are God's church gathered. And in a few moments we'll become God's church scattered. So now... May our witness be both glad and 
purposeful in seeking to be more like the city of God. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. Also with you. Thank you. God bless you. You are the